Hi everyone, my name is Leanne and today I'm going to be wrapping up all of the books that I read in September. <laughs> Almost forgot what month it was then. <laughs> I have eight books to talk to you about so I'm just gonna jump straight in there starting with the fiction for grown-ups and this is Everyone in this room will someday be dead by Emily Austin. I liked this book but I have quite complicated feelings about it. So we're following our main character Gilda who is about 26 or 27 years old and she has a lot of complicated things going on in her life but particularly in terms of her mental health. So she's a severely anxious person, she has a lot of panic attacks, she's continuously going to hospital because of these panic attacks and one day she decides to follow up on an advert for some therapy in her local church but she accidentally ends up getting a job as like kind of a receptionist in this church. This isn't the most obvious job for Gilda because one, she's an atheist and two, she's queer and she ends up hiding both of those parts of her identity in order to kind of conform in this new role that she's in. Her predecessor passed away and there seems to be some level of suspicion around the circumstances of her death and that's something that Gilda starts to dive into throughout her time at the job and she kind of ends up intermingled in her predecessor's life in a way that is not really appropriate. Gilda's life basically continues to spiral, she's not really taking care of herself, there's like breakdowns in all of her relationships because she has really poor communication. There are a lot of humorous elements to this book because of these kind of strange situations that she ends up getting herself in because of the breakdown in communication. It leads to a lot of kind of funny situations but it's like an uncomfortable kind of funny, like it's an uncomfortable humour. Gilda also disassociates a lot and I think that comes true in the narrative style. I'm actually struggling to figure out how I really felt about this book because I think I enjoyed it but I felt like consistently uncomfortable. If anyone else has read this one I'd be really intrigued to hear your thoughts on it. I also read To Lahore with Love by Hina Bellitz. So in this book we are following Addie who has always struggled with her sense of identity. She has been raised by both her Irish mother and her Pakistani nana and as her father has passed away that has really disrupted the connection that she feels towards her Pakistani roots. One of the main ways that Adi finds comfort is in cooking and in food and there's some fantastic food writing in this book including some recipes and while she has quite a complicated family life she does feel very happy and fulfilled in her relationship. She is married to a gorgeous guy named Gabe and she is so happy with him until one day she realises that he has cheated on her. In a desperate need to escape she finds herself going back to Lahore and trying to get more of a connection with her roots. I liked this book and as I said the food writing was really fantastic as was the sort of sense of place that you get in the passages that are set in Lahore. However in terms of the plot, in terms of this character's journey, in terms of what is meant to be quite a twist in this book, I didn't really find any of those elements particularly impactful. So it really was kind of a middle of the park read for me. I also read Square One by Nell Frizzle. This was so almost a five star for me. There were so many parts of it that I thought were absolutely fantastic and then there were just like some bits that made me really quite icky. <laughs> so this is about 30 year old Hannah who following the breakup of her long-term relationship is realizing that the person she was with probably never loved her and that's of course really difficult for her to deal with. She feels like she's starting all over again when all of her other friends seem to be settling down, you know, they're heading towards marriage and kids whereas Hannah is now moving back in with her dad. She doesn't have even her own space. She feels like she's regressing. And when she moves in with her dad that dynamic is quite a strange one because Hannah is starting starting to date again and so is her father. Which leads to many uncomfortable situations and they just, they made me feel really icky and to be honest that's probably the intent of those passages so maybe the book is doing exactly what it sets out to do by making me feel a bit icky but for every moment that made me feel a little bit uncomfortable there were so many other moments where I felt validated, I felt seen, <laughs> sort of just navigating the dating sphere and a lot of the emotional turbulence that comes with that, I felt it. <laughs> and while this definitely falls into that category of book that I talk about quite often on this channel which is, you know, young woman figuring her shit out, this book felt quite 
unique to me in terms of the voice and the narrative style. You know, I don't think it's the most original thing in the world, but it definitely had a different voice to a lot of those other kinds of books that I've read. It does often feel with those books that like the protagonist could be interchangeable amongst many of them. Whereas I think Hannah is somewhat individual compared to a lot of those other protagonists. There's a really sharp and oftentimes quite dark sense of humour to it as well, which I really enjoyed. I thought the depiction of strained family relationships was done really well, complicated family relationships, not just between Hannah and her father, but also Hannah and her mother. I thought that was all handled really well. And I found the ending really quite satisfying as well. So that is the fiction for Grown Ups. Let's do the non-fiction next. I read Misogynation by Laura Bates. Most of you I'm sure are already familiar with Laura Bates. Very well-known author, journalist, gender equality campaigner. So this is a collection of essays from Laura Bates and I thought each of the individual essays were, you know, really well written as you would expect from Laura Bates. I didn't find myself disagreeing with anything that she says. I think it's very rare that I would ever disagree with anything Laura Bates says. But in terms of this book as a collection of essays, I found it a little bit disjointed. I didn't find it particularly cohesive and I guess that's just because of the formatting of what these essays are, where they come from. This is essentially her collected essays from her Guardian column covering a plethora of different topics in relation to sexism, in relation to misogyny, gender equality. As I said, I thought the writing was great, the writing was solid, but just in terms of a collection, I don't think it necessarily works because there isn't like, it doesn't feel like a collective piece. It feels like, well, exactly what it is. It's just kind of a mishmash of these different essays. I also think I'm potentially just coming to this collection too late um, because, you know, these essays were published quite a few years ago and things have moved on a little bit since then. I didn't feel like I was necessarily getting a different perspective or learning anything new from these essays. But if you are someone who is a little bit more new to these kind of topics, who wants kind of a, a whistle stop tour on a lot of gender equality issues, then maybe this would be a great thing for you to head too because as I said the essays are great, the writing is great. I just think perhaps this would have been more beneficial to me earlier on in my journey of reading feminist texts. I also read Keep the Receipts by the creators of the podcast of the same name. So each of the three podcasters slash writers have their own little section in each subsection of this book. So there's a subsection about career, about beauty, about body, about dating, lots of different contemporary subjects that I'm really interested in reading about. And I think it was so great to get perspectives from women who have slightly different life experiences, slightly different living situations, different backgrounds. If you have listened to the Keep the Receipts podcast, it kind of just feels like you're reading an episode of the podcast. It's candid, it's funny, it's really honest, and I feel very privileged to have heard this sort of honesty from these women. I particularly enjoyed Audrey's sections. I just feel like <laughs> I have the most connection to like her experiences. I think it's a really empowering, relatable book. And I think reading this book could be a real sort of pick me up. It feels like you're sitting down with some friends. On the back, it actually says all the conversations and advice you've had in the club toilet, finally in one place. And I think that is pretty accurate. I also read Hands by Lauren Brown. This is a book that I had really high hopes for because it is a book that is about skin picking. The sort of obsessive compulsion to pick the skin more often than not around your fingertips, around your hands, um, which is something that I do. And it's something that I feel, it's one of the few things in my life that I feel kind of insecure about. I don't like that I do it. I want to kind of understand why I do it better. It comes from a place of habit. I d I'm not sure if it comes from anxiety for me, but it's definitely like an obsessive compulsion. So I was really interested to read a book about that. And I'm really glad I did read this book. I think I found it really sort of validating hearing from someone who also has the same bad habit, hearing about her journey to discovering why she kind of does this thing. But I do actually wish that there was more content around the actual skin picking. And I guess maybe the rationale behind why there isn't is because she's actually getting to the root of why she does it, which is her anxiety. So I think it makes total sense why it's kind of focused on her upbringing and her anxiety, but I kind of wanted more 
about the actual compulsion and you know if she if there's anything that she has done to kind of stave it off like anything that she's found might help with it i expected more of that kind of stuff from this book so i found myself naturally quite disappointed when there wasn't that but i would really like to reread this book without that expectation because there were a lot of things that she said that I did feel like a resonance with in terms of like why I do stuff, like why I do it. There was definitely some things that were really different in like why we do it. But also I had this brilliant sense when I was reading this book that we must be the exact same age. Like as I was reading this, there was loads of like references that she was making that just made me think we grew up in really similar environments at the exact same time. And then I Googled her and like, yeah, we're the exact same age. <laughs> I've never read a book that references DJ Booney before and DJ Booney was a big part of my life when I was younger. <laughs> there were so many references in this. Like there was a lot about like Dick and Dom in the bungalow. Uh, so I just knew we were the same age. <laughs> Ultimately, I thought this book was really, really great. I think it's one that I might revisit on audio as well. Cause I'm pretty sure the author reads it herself too, which is always a great listening experience. I also read These Are The Words by Nikita Gill. This is a proof copy, but the final collection is already out. This is a collection of YA poetry. So it's poetry aimed at teenagers, which I think is so fantastic. I have always wanted there to be sort of like more genre poetry in the same way that we have genre fiction. And I've always really appreciated how poetry for teens and poetry for children is not the same as more sort of literary poetry, just in the same way as it is with fiction. So I'm so glad that there is a growing space for this kind of poetry now. In saying that, I didn't really feel like this collection was particularly for me and that's absolutely fine. But I do think a younger reader would find this really impactful. It's a collection that is broken down into different seasons, which I think is a sort of framing device that is really great for these sorts of collections. It's a book about emotions. It's a book about relationships, whether that is family, friendship or indeed romantic and it's a collection that feels really warm and welcoming I think. One poem in particular that I really enjoyed was On the First Frost of Winter. That was the poem that stood out to me the most and the one that I did feel the most connection with. If you have a younger reader in your life who you think would like to get into poetry and these kinds of things and I think Nikita Gale is a fantastic poet for them to start with. And finally I read a children's book. I read The Battle for Perfect by Helena Duggan. This is the third book in a middle grade series that began with a place called perfect which was a book that I absolutely loved. I did really enjoy this third installment however comparing it to the first book I just didn't get on with it as much. I think you know the concept of the first book was so unique it was so amazing and I think as the series has progressed as the trilogy has progressed my enjoyment of it has somewhat dwindled. I can't really talk about the plot of the third book too much but I can certainly tell you about the sort of atmosphere of it because it does have the same sort of atmosphere that the first book has. It's very sort of creepy, kind of uncanny. It feels like sort of Rodal, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, a series of unfortunate events. It's adventurous, it's dangerous, and in this third book there are also zombies. So if you're looking for a slightly Halloween-y read then I would definitely recommend. It's adventurous, it's spooky, and in this installment there are some zombies. So, you know, definitely suitable in the lead up to Halloween. It does have that element of middle grades that I really love where it's like the kids are the ones that understand what's happening and the adults are slightly useless most of the time. It has friendship at its core, which is so important in these kind of adventures. And it is very intriguing to see how the mystery unfolds. As I said, this series has sort of petered off for me. I still think it would be enjoyable for a middle grade reader. I think they would get a lot more enjoyment of all three books than I did. For me, I suppose the series is potentially a victim of its own success for me because I loved that first book so much. That first book just had so many things that I really love in middle grade fiction. So there we have it. They are all of the books that I read in September. Do leave me a comment down below and let me know if you've read any of these books and what you thought of them. Let me know if any of them are now being added to your TBR after hearing what I think of them. And if you don't have anything in particular to say, leave me one of the many different hand emojis that there are in honor of Lauren Brown's book. That is it for me today. I hope you guys are doing well and I will speak to you in my next video.